Every once in a while, I get asked to cover the Xbox One security, and that is an interesting story, simply because its security has not yet been defeated. There are a number of reasons for this, of course. The first is that Microsoft invested heavily on security after the Xbox 360. And for those people interested, Microsoft security architect Tony Chen in 2019 discussed Xbox One security in detail and what makes the system extremely difficult to defeat. But Microsoft would also remove motivation for hacking the Xbox One, and they did this by adding developer mode or dev mode. If we go back and consider why consoles are hacked, it's usually for three reasons. First off, there's piracy, which is simply the ability to run illegal versions of games. Number two would be the ability to run other operating systems such as Linux. And third is the ability to run emulators and homebrew. These three motivators hold true in just about every console that has been hacked in the past, all the way up to the Sony PlayStation 4 when Sony famously removed other OS from the PS3, users from all three groups, Piracy, Linux, and Homebrew, worked together to defeat the PS3 security, which they did so in a matter of months. The motivation to run unsigned code on any console is high, but what if you took away that motivation and allowed Homebrew or unsigned code access, albeit in a tightly confined sandbox? This is exactly what developer mode does on the Xbox One line of consoles. To explain further, a retail Xbox you buy from the store actually comes with two modes, retail mode and developer mode. In retail mode, the console is in the state that the customer or user of an Xbox One console would use when you turn it on. You can play games and run apps like you normally would. However, in developer mode, you can develop software for the console. This is essentially a dev kit but you cannot play retail games or run retail apps. Developer mode can be enabled on any retail Xbox One system, and you can switch back and forth between retail and developer modes. Developer mode is not new, however. It's an inexpensive way to develop games for the Xbox One, and it's a easy way to get into Xbox game console development. There's a one-time cost of $20 to activate, and it does remove the motivation on the homebrew and emulation group to want to hack the Xbox One, as that mode is available already. Developer mode does come with limitations, however. Dev mode is something I've dabbled with in the past and wanted to discuss on the channel, but I never felt it was quite compelling enough on its own. But now we have a new generation of Xbox with the Series S and Series X, dev mode is still there, and all of a sudden, you're getting so much more power and performance, and at $299, you can turn an Xbox Series S into one of the best emulation boxes out there. So let's jump in and see what's actually possible. Setting up an Xbox Series S for dev mode is easy, but keep in mind, once you switch over, you cannot play retail games, but you can easily switch back and forth between retail mode and dev mode, and you won't lose anything. The only problem is, you can't have both at the same time. To set up dev mode, simply download the dev mode activator from the Xbox store and just walk through the steps. As mentioned, there's a one-time cost of $20 to grant you a license to use it. I'll leave a link to a guide on setting it up in the description below, but once you follow through with the steps, the system will ask you to reboot and when you come back, you'll be in dev mode and this is the view that you'll see. Now from here, we will need to download some emulators, and this is where the fun starts. But keep in mind, there are a few things going on here. First off, this dev mode will not give you full access to the hardware, and as such, the emulators that we are going to use are built as UWP apps. UWP stands for Universal Windows Platform. It's Microsoft's method to create and run Windows 10 applications on many different supported devices, such as computers, laptops, tablets, the Xbox One and the Xbox Series S and X. The core API runs on many different devices. The downside of UWP is that it's very high level and somewhat restrictive. Although dev mode was confirmed to be a part of the Xbox Series S and Series X, it does not add any hardware specific features to it. Microsoft themselves have already pretty much abandoned UWP, confirming in 2019 that it's not likely to be supported going forward. Dev mode on a retail Xbox One or Series S will support UWP apps, however. But as mentioned, UWP does not give you access to lower level features and hardware. 
But with that said, there are some UWP built emulators that run on the Xbox One and indeed the Xbox Series X and Series S, which we can install and run thanks to backward compatibility. So let's get on to the good stuff. And there is some really impressive stuff going on here. The only emulator that you'll need to download and install is RetroArch. There is a specific Xbox One UWP app that we can download from the website. This will run under backward compatibility on the Series S. To install it, you will need to take note of the HTTP address on the Xbox One demo that has been set up for you. To do this, simply enter the URL into your web browser, which should bring up the Xbox device portal. And from here, click on Add in My Games and Apps, select the RetroArch Xbox UWP, press Next, and then Start to install. After around 30 seconds, the app will be installed onto the Xbox, and you'll see it on your list of installed apps. Keep in mind, you will need an Xbox Live account to sign in and run the app once you do, and with any luck, you'll see a familiar RetroArch Blue screen. So how good is the emulation? And this is where the fun starts. Right off the bat is that you'll get some of the very best emulation that I've seen on a console, pretty much beating everything that I've seen on high level Android devices like the Nvidia Shield TV. Dolphin, the GameCube and Nintendo Wii emulator have been added to RetroArch recently and it's very impressive, but there are some compatibility issues. The good stuff here, however, is that games like The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, Mario Strikers, Metroid Prime, Mario Kart Double Dash, Luigi's Mansion and Fire Emblem all run really well. Now, it's not perfect. The biggest thing are the stutters, either during disk access or shader compilation, and there may be an option to fix this. It doesn't seem like that the SSD is really being utilized here in any meaningful way, and most of these stutters are minor. I did install all the games onto the internal SSD, although you can just as easily use an external USB drive to load your games from. Another GameCube title that has always had issues is Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2. On the Xbox Series S, it's fast and fluid 95% of the time. Now, I'm not an expert on Retro Arch and Dolphin settings, and if there is a way to smooth this out, please let me know in the comments below. But I did keep the Retro Arch settings 99% stock, other than change the video drive from OpenGL to DirectX 11, which offered the best compatibility. But taking a step back for a second, I'm absolutely amazed at how a $299 console can handle GameCube emulation like this. It's seriously impressive and one of the best reasons to check out dev mode on the Xbox Series S. I also took a quick look at the Nintendo Wii running under Dolphin, and it plays quite nicely. It's difficult to talk about emulating the Wii, however, due to its unique control system, which doesn't translate well to a conventional gamepad. But technically, the Series S does a fine job with the Wii with what I tested on it, and it does show off the power of the hardware. Sega Saturn is a console that is notorious for struggling under emulation, although in recent times we have seen some significant advancements with Yava Sanshiro for Android devices as well as Mednafen that runs on the PC. RetroArch comes with Beetle Saturn emulation and well, it's fantastic as you would expect, the Series S handles the emulation with ease with no dips at all with what I played so far, that included Panzer Dragoons Y, Guardian Heroes, and Magic Knight Ray Earth. Having a good Sega Saturn emulation experience for me is very important, and the combination of Retro Arch and the Series S delivers on that. Moving on to Sega Dreamcast, it's another system that has had advancements in recent times. Over on the Series S, I did try a few titles. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 was the highlight for me running quite nicely. Crazy Taxi ran great as well. Even the legendary Skies of Arcadia did run exceptionally well. Now I did have some compatibility issues. Metropolis Street Racer would not load beyond the initial FMV. RetroArch is using Raycast for its Dreamcast emulator and overall it scales up quite nicely on the Xbox Series S. As you can gather by now, the Series S is fast turning into my favorite emulation box. Sega Dreamcast is not perfect, but it is overall a very good experience once again. Nintendo 64 is another system that's had its ups and downs, but it's also very well supported here as you would expect. 
I did run into a few compatibility issues and GoldenEye still runs poorly. But these are minor nitpicks with the majority of ROMs that I tested running exceptionally well and I think if you're a fan of the Nintendo 64 you'll have no complaints here whatsoever. PlayStation 1 is a system that has been emulated well for many many years. We expect good emulation on the Series S with RetroArch and it delivers just that. For me, Tekken 3 is the benchmark, with some cheaper devices struggling to hold its 60 FPS lock. On the Series S with dev mode, smooth as butter as you would expect. Another system that really struggles to hold its frame rate on cheaper devices is Sony PSP. I can tell you that PSP emulation on the Series S is really good. Testing out a few games such as God of War Ghost of Sparta, Crisis Core, Virtua Tennis and Ultimate Ghouls and Ghosts all ran exactly how you would expect. Silky smooth at full frame rates with no issues whatsoever. This is very impressive because once again PSP does have a tendency to dip frames every once in a while. Now full disclaimer here, I only ran about 5 to 10 minutes of each game in the beginning so there still may be issues as you play through these games and my comparison really has been against other devices that I've tested in the past such as the Nvidia Shield TV and the Raspberry Pi. I also tested out Nintendo DS emulation which runs great but like the Nintendo Wii emulating the touch and stylus doesn't really offer a great user experience. You can map the stylus and touch to the thumbsticks but it's just not right for my liking. Still I was impressed at how the Series S handles the emulation once again. And to round out 8, 16 bit and handheld systems like the Sega Genesis, Super NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance all work as expected. RetroArch has so many cores that I couldn't possibly run through them all. And speaking of cores, there is now talk of PlayStation 2 emulation being added to RetroArch via PCSX2. If this ends up in the UWP build, all of a sudden the Xbox Series S would be compatible with PS1 and PS2 games, something that Sony currently doesn't have much interest in adding on the PS5. When PS2 emulation makes its way to the Xbox Series S, we will definitely cover it on the channel. So in conclusion, dev mode on the Series S can turn your system into a killer emulation box that handles everything from chip 8 to the Nintendo Wii and everything in between at the best performance I've seen for the price. I absolutely love it. The original Xbox was applauded for being one of the best emulation boxes that stood the test of time and I'm getting a similar feeling with the Series S and its dev mode. The possibilities here are enormous. There's potential for PS2, Nintendo Wii U and Nintendo Switch to run on the hardware and I'll definitely keep everyone updated on progress as it comes out. So there you have it guys, that is emulation on developer mode on the Xbox Series S and I gotta say as you've seen it's very impressive. Let me know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. Is this something you're planning on checking out? And if you do have a Series X, let me know what your experience is with running RetroArch on that. In theory, it should run a little better than the Series S. But guys, I'm going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.